Hi there, everyone. Gary Bronze here again to welcome you to the sixth and final episode in our series on kidney disease. Here, so for today, Dory, Melissa, and Jane are helping us understand everything we need to know about in-center dialysis. So last week we did home dialysis. Now we're doing in-center dialysis. Um, Jane, uh, why don't you uh, get us off the ground here? Today we're going to talk about in-center dialysis. Right now in the kidney community, there is a big push for home programs and home programs definitely have their advantage. The push is multifactorial, uh, some of it patient-centered and some of it um, just reality-centered in the fact that we have uh, an, literally an exploding population of patients with kidney disease and limited facilities and you can actually do more patients at home than you can uh, feasibly given the manpower and space and center. But be that as it may, whatever you choose, whichever in center, at home, hemo or peritoneal, it's your decision. Uh, I would strongly encourage you if you're thinking about home or in center, to talk to people who have done it, find out, talk to people who were happy and talk to people who weren't happy and find out why. Now, we all know there are some people who are chronically not happy. Uh, but if, the other thing is if you choose in center and actually if you choose a home modality, visit the clinic. When you walk into a dialysis unit, you should have a feeling for it. Uh, talk to the people. Is this a place where you want to really be spending a good deal of your time? And are these people that you feel you want to turn your care uh, or entrust with your care or share your care with? Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of practicalities. For example, I have a number of patients who live 150 to 200 miles away. They want to continue their care with us, but it's just not practical to drive in three days a week to have hemodialysis. So there are a lot of factors in your decision, but dialyzing in center is your choice. Many people prefer in-center dialysis. In fact, in this country, most people start in center, which is kind of interesting because in many other countries, that's not your choice. You start at home first, and then in-center is second choice. Um, generally, just practically speaking, in-center dialysis is three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Some uh, programs offer a nocturnal. I have a nocturnal unit. My patients come about five o'clock in the evening, five to six. They leave anywhere from three to four in the morning. Um, they sleep. Um, we have a couple of beds. We have uh, Pullman beds that come down from the wall. Uh, sometimes they just come in, in a sleeping bag in the chair. The advantage to nocturnal is if you're working, it allows you to uh, dialyze at night, sleep, and go to work. Uh, for people who have a lot of trouble managing their fluid, it's also very good because it's a slow dialysis. It's six to eight hours, and you can take off a lot more fluid in a longer period of time. It's also very good for people who have uh, certain cardiac conditions because hemodialysis is stressful to your heart. Um, and nocturnal dialysis being of longer and slower is not as stressful. What you have to do is show up, but you have to show up on your time, on your day. Um, if you have something that you want to do, we, we do try to work with you uh, to change your schedule. Sometimes we can get a patient to switch with you. But if you decide you wanna sleep in and you have a five o'clock chair and you show up at seven, someone is coming in right after you. And so you will only get a 
a shortened dialysis, which isn't a good idea. Uh, most dialysis patients dialyze uh, three to four hours. Uh, it depends on a lot of different factors. I do have some patients who dialyze five hours. Um, you have a team taking care of you. That team includes a nurse, a tech, if you're lucky, an advanced practitioner like Moa. Um, you have a social worker and a dietitian. The social worker and the dietitian may not be available all the time, but they are available. You have someone looking at you three days a week. Your blood is drawn at least once a month. Your blood pressure is checked every 30 minutes while you're on treatment. Um, it's a lot of attention. And there is a theory that some people do better on uh, hemodialysis simply because they are getting better care than they have gotten before. I mean, how many people have health professionals seeing them three days a week? Um, on a less practical side, hemodialysis is very social. Um, I've had patients who have sat next to each other and played cards. Um, they talk back and forth. Sometimes it is like a party going on there. And so it can be very social. On the other hand, if the person in the chair next to you just rubs you the wrong way or snores, that's not always so pleasant. But again, we try to do our best to accommodate patients and what uh, their preferences are. Next slide, please. So how do you get dialysis? Well, whenever we talk about dialysis, we talk about an access. An access is a way to get something. So if you were gonna get to something rather, if you were going to do peritoneal dialysis, your access would be that catheter, that hollow tube that's inserted by your belly button. Um, there are three types of accesses. The first one is a fistula. Now, ideally a fistula uh, is the best uh, because there's nothing artificial. You have, and, and anytime you're doing something medical and you're looking at blood vessels, a blue is a vein, red is an artery. So a surgeon connects an artery and a vein right here. And this has to develop. It takes uh, usually a couple of months for it to develop because what you're doing is you're turning this vein into uh, a very strong, basically almost artery type vessel. Um, there are complications that can happen with fistula placement. Sometimes the blood, uh, you reduce the blood flow past the fistula and that can be a problem, but generally they can be reworked. The advantage to a fistula is there's nothing artificial um, and they allegedly last longer, although I do have a patient and I think he's going on 20 years with the same graft. So it's really hard to say, but I've told, said before what I think about averages. Um, what is important is that you get an access that is right for your internal anatomy, which the surgeon determines after he or she uh, sees an ultrasound. The fistula can be in your lower arm or your upper arm. Um, this is a graft. And again, remember this is under the skin, but this takes a piece of artificial material and grafts it to an artery and to a vein. And the um, blood flows from your body through a machine, it's cleaned and it's returned. Um, that means that you're going to have two needles in your arm or leg. Um, usually we start with the arm um, three days a week. And if anyone has just passed out from needle phobia, I have an answer for that. Um, graphs 
there is one type of graph that can be used in 24 hours. Sometimes they can be used in uh, a, a month, but a graph can be put in often in patients who ha don't have very good veins. Uh, you can usually put a graft in. Again, it can be in the lower arm, upper arm, or you can put grafts in the thighs. This is the dreaded catheter. And actually, Gary, if you could switch back to me a minute, please. I'm not seeing me. Well, maybe uh, let's just go back to the slides. I have a catheter and a heart with me. And we can see your picture in the screen where your face is there. Yeah, I, I see you. As long as it's either in side by side speaker or gallery, I, I can see you. Speaker, okay. you're larger. And you see this heart? Because I yep. can see it. Okay. Yep, I see it. Okay. This is the catheter. We don't like catheters for many reasons. One is they don't give you a good dialysis. And two, um, they tend to get infected. The catheter usually goes right below your collarbone. And you have this um, tube that is going into the top right chamber of your heart. Um, the advantage to a catheter is that if you have an access and something goes wrong with it, uh, or say it quits working or it's not working like it should, you can put a catheter in and have a person on dialysis in a matter of hours. Um, unfortunately, some people, it is their only choice, but we try to avoid this, which is one reason why we really encourage people to get education early and to make a decision. Hopefully the next time you see your kidney provider, whether it's a physician or an advanced practitioner, you can tell them what form of dialysis you prefer and you can uh, decide when you need to start preparing for it. As I said, a fistula, I like to give six to eight months on a fistula. A graft, we can do that in a couple of weeks. If you want to do it at home with peritoneal dialysis, um, it's can be uh, ready in a month and a catheter is a matter of hours. Next slide. So as I said before, before you go to dialysis, visit the dialysis center, get the vibe. How do you feel about coming in there? There are requirements. For instance, you have to have a TB skin test or x-ray and you also have, a, have to have a hepatitis B screen. Find out from your provider, are you going to need to bring a headset? Where is the TV? What is the parking like? And what transportation services are available? If you're driving, is there a place to park? Um, is it in a part of town that's easily accessible to you? There are many questions, but you're gonna be spending a lot of time in the dialysis center. So you need to really make sure that it's a place that you're gonna be comfortable in where you wanna go. Okay, next. So for many patients, it's not a matter of if they need dialysis, but it's where and how. So you have a choice, PD, hemodialysis, home or in center. Home offers independence, more mobility, and it's easier to work. In center means a healthcare team has eyes on you three days a week. On any form, you can travel, work, or spend time with your family. While on hemodialysis, there uh, gives you time to read, watch TV, knit, take a nap, or catch up with whatever you need to catch up with. 
Now for people with needle phobia, we have this wonderful cream that uh, you put on your arm. It is lidocaine pralocaine, and it is a cousin to Novocaine that your dentist uses. So when some patients want it, some patients don't, but it's simply writing a prescription. Uh, it works for the vast majority of patients. And I think that was it for me, wasn't it? Yes. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dory. Hey guys. Um, so Jane touched on a lot of sort of what is associated with choosing in-center dialysis over some other modalities, but there's a couple of other things that I wanted to just um, mention. So um, three main things to look at is schedule, transportation, and support. And these can be pretty big factors in your decision on what, what type of dialysis to take. Um, Gary, could you go to the next slide? So as Jane had mentioned, in-center dialysis is typically done three times a week for four hours per treatment. Sometimes when people have some significant residual kidney function, maybe they'll do two days a week for a little bit. Sometimes if patients um, are big fluid gainers or they just can't tolerate um, a full treatment, they might do four, hour, four days a week. Um, it really will vary based on your individual needs. But when you're looking at the time frame for dialysis, it's more than just the hours spent on the machine. And that's when they talk about hours per treatment. That's the time you are on the machine while the machine is running, cleaning your blood and removing fluid from your body. In addition to that time that you know you'll be there, you'll be given an appointment time and you'll arrive probably a few minutes before your appointment time. Um, Hopefully the clinic will be running on time and they'll pull you back for your appointment time. But when you come in, they'll weigh you, they'll take your temperature. They should have you wash your hands and your arm. They will, my clinics gave, would write all this down on a little piece of paper and give it to the patient to walk back to their chair. They, they would talk to the nurse or the tech that was checking them in who would check their blood pressure, both sitting and standing. And then um, just verify some information, confirm that you haven't been feeling bad since your last treatment, any signs and symptoms of your last treatment, any falls. Um, of course, now they're doing COVID questioning. So then um, once those questions are done, they will get you connected to your machine, either hooking up a catheter or um, inserting your needles. They'll get your machine flowing. Um, they'll put the legs on your chair up and you'll start going. And that can take for, for some people, once you walk through the door and be weighed, you know, maybe as little as 15 minutes up to a half an hour, depending on what else is going on at the time. And it's called changeovers during that time when one shift is ending and the other one's beginning. So you go through your treatment. Um, hopefully you can sleep or have a good neighbor to pass the time. Um, I found that people that work in a dialysis center, either they are there forever because they love it. I think probably like Jane and Melissa um, and I love working in the renal field. So they're either there forever and they have a great passion and a great advocacy for the people that they work with, or maybe they don't like it and they just won't last very long. Um, they'll move on to go find another job. But you will have those people that have been there for a really long time that'll stick with you and really be there and they'll be such great advocates and sources of information for you. So once your treatment's over, um, you'll kind of do the opposite. You will um, have a sitting and standing blood pressure, making sure that everything looks good, making sure that you don't need any extra fluids at the end of the treatment. Um, they'll decannulate you or disconnect you from the machine. Um, and then um, you will weigh and then you will go on home. During the treatment, you have a lot of services that come to you. You, if you need medications, you'll be given medications. Um, the doctor will round on you or the um, clinician will round on you, either a, um, a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant, um, the dietitian and the social worker. Um, if you're not split between clinics, are likely to be there with you to address any questions that you have. Most centers have individual TVs for people to watch. Um, and depending on the state that you live in, probably depends on the type of cable services that you have on that TV. Um, 
If you need antibiotics for some reason, a lot of times that can be given at the dialysis center, either with or after treatment, depending on the type of antibiotic. They can do different lab work for you that they'll do monthly. So you don't have to make extra trips for any of those things. Uh, Gary, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So transportation is a major factor um, for our patients coming to dialysis. And the difficult part about transportation is if you don't have transportation to your appointment, depending on the center that works with you, it may be difficult to be a home training candidate. So if you have any fears of transportation and in-center dialysis is something you're interested in, there is a social worker that is accessible to you, even if they are not there every single day, they are accessible to you that can help troubleshoot this. And so again, depending on your state and then more specifically your county, um, I've worked with transportation resources where um, they pick people up individually in a cab or they pick up a cohort of people um, and bring you, but it's specific medical transportation that will pick you up at your home or the designated spot you need to be. Um, some of the bigger cities, you know, like New York City, you'll, you take the subway to your dialysis treatment. Um, there are less individualized resources that way. Uh, for people that drive, at least in my state, um, people who drive and have Medicaid may be eligible for Medicaid gas vouchers that can help with the cost of transportation. Um, there are some people that go to a dialysis unit that may be on a stretcher or may not be able to um, what's called sit unassisted in a vehicle or in a wheelchair, and they may be appropriate for like a non-emergency ambulance transportation. So if you do decide to do in-center and you see ambulances in front of the building all the time, it doesn't mean that there's an emergency, but just that they're doing everything they can to get the people to dialysis that need to get there. And then certainly, you know, if you're feeling well enough to drive to dialysis, you can absolutely do that. Um, I had patients that maybe for their first couple of treatments, they would choose to use a, um, a friend or a family member or a transportation resource just until they knew how they feel. Um, I had people driving motorcycles to dialysis once they felt really comfortable. I don't like motorcycles at baseline. Um, I don't think motorcycles were a great idea, but this guy felt well enough and that was sort of his sense of control to get out and, and the freedom in the air and go to his dialysis center and sort of just contemplate his life and his treatment and, and go on to dialysis. And so that worked very well for him. Um, but there are lots, there, there can be many different options and transportation will look different for everybody. Um, and it just really is gonna depend on the resources that you have available in your state and in your county and sometimes as small as a town. Um, Jane mentioned about rural areas, you know, it can be more difficult to get back and forth in rural areas and maybe you might be a better, home treatment might be better for you in those instances. Um, but if there are any barriers to transportation, talking with your dialysis center, specifically the dialysis social worker, can help really connect you with what's going on. And don't, yeah, I, I don't want to say this in a negative way, but don't waste your time spinning wheels trying to figure out how you're getting to dialysis if you don't know how to get there. The dialysis social worker has likely done this over and over and over again and will know what resources you have available. There's some insurance plans that provide um, transportation and um, gas reimbursement. Some of our, um, they're called, in North Carolina, they're called special needs plans where they combine like a Medicare and a Medicaid and you get like a combined benefit and they have some transportation benefits built into there. So don't, you know, throw it out the window, explore your options, ask questions, see what's available because nobody's gonna know what you need unless you ask for it. Um, and so Gary, if you could go to the next slide. And, and support. So you, we talked last week about doing home dialysis and how you are independent and you have those resources at home and maybe you have support from other areas in your life. Um, but when you choose the in-center dialysis, you have support people right there, nurses, dietitians, social workers available at all of your treatments. You have access to patients that will become your friends um, for, you know, at each treatment. And so you can talk about what's going on with you and how you're feeling and, and you will develop a kinship with them. Um, and of course, with any kinship, you know, if there's a loss in the dialysis unit, that can be very profound as well, but you have support from the team to help you through that. 
Typically, um, you know, if you come in with a low blood pressure or a high blood pressure or a wound or, or something that you really need attention to, the nurse or the charge nurse can contact the, the provider, the clinician that's working with you and get you an answer that day as to what's going on. Um, I'm working with kind of a, a complicated patient at the hospital right now who has had a heart transplant, but he's also on dialysis. And so when talking about his discharge plan and, you know, does he need to go to a nursing home or does he need to go here or there? One of the, the great factors that we have is the fact that he is on dialysis three times a week. And so he does have access to that medical attention and that requirement to get out of his home is sort of a physical therapy option for him. But he does have access to ongoing medical care three days a week. Where, where they can address his needs if, if needed and not wait for a weekly doctor's office visit to pick up all the pieces that may have fallen apart during the week. So um, support can be a really big factor in the dialysis unit. I think we always try to make it fun. Um, we try to have bingo games or dress up for the holidays or um, our company would do like box lunches for some of the bigger holidays. Just something to sort of spruce things up because it can be a very difficult environment to be in, you know, working with people who are, who are feeling chronically ill. Um, there's some people that are just going to feel better. And you'll notice that the people that tend to feel better are the people that are um, making choices in, in their healthcare and their lifestyle choices, the diet and the fluid and the medication management that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. You'll find that those patients tend to feel a little bit better um, and, and be more pleasant to be around. Um, so with that, I am going to let Melissa talk to us about how this will change our lifestyles. Thanks, Story. And um, you know, the biggest part of the lifestyle change is not only um, traveling to the dialysis center for three um, shifts, generally a week. And so there's the early morning, afternoon, evening, and in some cases, nocturnal. Um, the stricter diet would be the other part. I, I, the diet, once someone is on dialysis, is the strictest of all of the different um, variations of the, the renal diet that we have. Um, and Jane and Dory did a nice time of really going through and talking about what treatment is like. But something to consider as well is oftentimes you may have a doctor's appointment that conflicts with your dialysis treatment day. And so it's really important that if um, a treatment is missed that it's rescheduled because um, we wanna make sure that you're getting all of those, uh, the treatments, treatments in. Some patients may feel tired after treatment. Other patients, as Dory was saying, they might drive themselves to and from treatment. I've had patients who take their bike to and from treatment. Um, so it really, every, every patient's a little different in terms of, their energy level um, before and after treatment. I've had some patients say that they're, they go home and they nap and they're not that hungry. And then I have other patients that say they are ravenous on dialysis days. So it's really every, every patient is a little bit different in how they respond. Um, but just things to think about is that it is as many patients say it's a part-time job, um, spending that time in the dialysis center three times a week. And then we've talked before with peritoneal dialysis, um, and it's the same with hemodialysis. It's just that coordinating travel with dialysis centers in the travel destination desired. Next slide, please. So when we think about our diet for our kidneys on hemodialysis, there's a lot of P words. And I often find that it gets confusing for people to um, figure out, okay, these foods fall into the protein category, these foods fall into the potassium category, these foods fall into the phosphorus category. And so there's a lot of P words that we, that we talk about. And we've talked about these in previous weeks, um, but generally once someone is on dialysis, all of these different pieces come together and we 
are um, limiting potassium, we're limiting phosphorus, we're limiting dairy, we're limiting our fluids, we're limiting sodium. The one thing we actually eat more and need more of is protein. And the reason for that is we lose a little bit of protein along with um, water soluble vitamins like our B vitamins, like thiamine, riboflavin, and vitamin C. We lose those during dialysis treatment. So we have to replace them through foods or sometimes through supplements. So it might be a protein supplement. It might be a, a kidney specific vitamin formula um, on dialysis, but we're generally looking at making swaps of foods that maybe are lower in potassium versus the higher potassium one. So it's a little bit of a balance. And like Dory and Jane said, there is a dietitian that is in the facilities that work with the patients to really help to make sure that they're understanding the diet and, and can help customize um, their, their diets for them um, and, and help them through that. Next slide, please. So when we talk about protein, we wanna eat a larger serving. So we've talked before, um, of before we, we did any of the treatments, we were talking about protein and we wanna eat less protein when we're not on dialysis. But when we get on dialysis, we're going to start eating more protein. And so generally at this point, we want it to look like the size of the palm of the hand or a little bit bigger. And we want to make sure that we're getting protein in with meals and snacks every day. So there used to be this two for the road um, competition or education that patients would get that when they left dialysis treatment, they wanted to have um, two protein servings or a protein serving once they left dialysis as a snack. So it might be um, some eggs or a protein shake. It could be half of a chicken salad sandwich or a tuna salad sandwich, just something to replace some of that protein that, that we've lost. Now, some dialysis centers will provide a protein supplement during treatment if a specific blood level called albumin, which is a protein in our blood, if that's low, um, we often will replace, we uh, provide a supplement to replace some of that protein that we, that we need. Um, and so depending on the level of albumin, there may be a supplement that is provided in the dialysis center three times a week. Next slide, please. So protein, we talked about this. Um, I'm sorry, this is phosphorus, sorry. Phosphorus, so there are three ways to remove um, phosphorus or manage phosphorus. And so we talk about dialysis, the dialysis treatment itself, which isn't always the best re uh, removal of phosphorus. You remove more in the beginning of treatment, but less as it goes on, it's not gonna clear a lot. So taking medication and diet, um, watching your diet becomes extremely important in managing phosphorus. And we've talked in previous sessions about phosphorus and looking at phosphorus additives, reading the food label um, for phosphorus additives. Um, so that becomes even more important as patients are on dialysis. This is often one of the hardest, um, the hardest lab value for patients to, to manage. And we do monitor the labs that come in, the lab results. Um, generally, patients have a full lab panel drawn once a month. And then on those, on that lab panel, they look at phosphorus and potassium. Um, and the dietitian and the nurses and, and your providers will review those labs with you and, and make adjustments and recommendations to your diet and medication based on your on those lab results. Um, and phosphorus is, is just one of those ones that we work a lot with, um, with patients because it is so hard to control. So watching the diet, taking um, medication that binds phosphorus from the food that we eat becomes really important in addition to making sure that you come to all of your dialysis treatments. And you normally wouldn't be started on a phosphorus binder medication until um, you start dialysis and the phosphorus level increases. Next slide, please. So potassium. So again, we have talked about, about, about potassium before, but we definitely start to see levels increase once someone is on dialysis. And high potassium levels can affect your heart. And some patients may have a heart attack if it gets too high. Um, so we're really very cautious of keeping potassium levels within a normal range. 
And so we look at the foods that we're eating and potassium is abundant in fruits, vegetables, um, proteins, beans, nuts, and seeds. And so a lot of times we want patients to get all this potassium, I'm sorry, this protein in from their, their, um, their protein foods like, like chicken or fish, but we have to also keep in mind that there is potassium in that as in well. So we kind of, we balance that out by choosing lower potassium fruits and vegetables. So what could that mean? Um, instead of tomato sauce, we might be doing a olive oil sauce on pasta. Instead of having a banana, uh, maybe we're swapping out the banana for uh, a serving of grapes. So on your plate at, at dinner, instead of having uh, a winter squash, maybe we're doing some green beans instead. And the one thing with potassium, like anything, we wanna keep that portion in mind. So whenever we look at those food lists, you probably have seen them on the internet where they talk about these are lower potassium foods, these are higher potassium foods. Those are generally looking at a half cup serving portion. Um, and so if you had you know, green beans, which are generally on the low potassium list and you had a half a cup, great. If you had a cup and a half, now you've taken a lower potassium food and now we have a lot more potassium at that meal. So we always wanna balance out the lower potassium foods with the portion of the portion size for the potassium food. Next slide, please. And then sodium in fluid, we talked a lot about this in previous sessions. This is a screenshot from one of the education pieces that are available on the um, NKF website or kidney.org and they have um, handouts on sodium and potassium and protein and phosphorus. So there's a lot of great handouts there um, that, that you can um, download and look at. But when we, we talk about sodium fluid, generally most patients are limited to about 32 ounces or four cups a day. And sometimes there's variations in that depending if the patient is still producing any urine. Um, and, but that counts for everything. It could be a sauce, it could be gravy, it could be juice, it could be a popsicle that's going to melt into water, it could be ice cubes. So it's really anything that melts and we look at about four cups a day total. Now, sometimes patient, there, there may be patients are told to look at how much fruits or vegetables are eating because there are obviously water content in all of our foods, not just fruits and vegetables. In general, um, patients have the harder time controlling fluids by the beverages that they're drinking, or um, like I said, foods that, that melt um, at room temperature, more so than fruits and vegetables. Uh, I, I tend to find that, that most patients aren't really meeting fruit and vegetable needs in general. Um, so unless you're chowing down on like half of a large watermelon. Um, generally, it shouldn't be as much of a concern from the food as, as more so from things like soup or if you're, like I said, doing a popsicle, um, ice cubes, things like that. And so we really wanna make sure that we're flavoring and seasoning our foods without added salt. And this is a good practice to have even before starting dialysis is really making that swap and choosing foods that do not have added salt in them, learning to cook with various herbs and spices to season your food so you don't need to add the salt in the, in the food to make it taste good. And you'll notice once you start following a lower sodium um, lifestyle that it only takes a few weeks and you have some Thing, your taste buds adjust and then you have something with salt in it and you're like, oof, this is really salty. So your taste buds do adjust to a lower sodium um, lifestyle. And then we would encourage patients if they want any like snack foods, like chips or pretzels or crackers to find the low um, or no added salt variety, varieties of those. But keep in mind things like potato chips are obviously going to be higher in potassium since that comes from potatoes and potatoes are a higher potassium food. Next slide, please. And that is it. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, let's see if anybody has any questions here. Uh, if uh, you do, you can unmute yourself, you can go into the chat feature, and uh, we'll see if we can answer your questions. I have a question. This is Nadia. 
So my question is, um, I'm a stage three, so I'm not a dialysis patient, but um, as far as my water, I drink bottled water instead of tap. Is that good for my kidneys or does it even make a difference? I mean, unless, unless the water has a lot of, um, like your tap water source has a lot of, like there's something added to it, it, it shouldn't necessarily affect the kidneys. Like sometimes you may find like a water report. Sometimes they have those, you should be able to download those and it can tell you kind of what levels are in the water. Like maybe there's a lot of, um, you know, if you have lead in your pipes or if you, um, like medications, sometimes a lot of people flush medications down the toilet and they can kind of show you if there's levels of things in the water. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily tell patients they have to drink filtered or, or bottled water. It's, it's really more of looking at fluid in general that I, I focus more on and, and making sure we're, we're monitoring that. Jane, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I, I was going to say about the same thing, you know, for the most part, now, I find different places, sometimes I don't like the way their water tastes, but uh, fortunately where I live, we have excellent uh, water, but there is an area not far from here where they uh, mine a lot of limestone and they've got a lot of calcium in their water. But for the okay. most part, it, it doesn't make any difference whether it's bottled or tap, it's your own taste in your own wallet. Okay, because I am concerned about some areas that um, that I go to where uh, where I live at, where the water is not good. So I do prefer to buy bottles well, that, um, for, for that reason. The, the and then as far as, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, I was going to say, and as far as the intake, um, is it does it matter at stage three what kind of intake you have, or is it just pretty much okay? I, I don't usually... I don't know, Melissa, would you limit? No, I don't, I don't usually limit fluids unless, you know, we start to see swelling and edema and we have some, you know, if there's congestive heart failure or something right. else going on, but stage three, you know, normally we don't have those, those problems. Like we might see them when someone um, is a later stage four, beginning of stage five, we might start to see some issues, but um, stage three, normally I'm more focused on protein content. Let's start getting familiar with phosphorus and reading labels um, right. more so than limiting fluid. The, the only thing okay. I would say, Nadia, is that you do need to look at your labels because I know there are certain bottled waters where they put phosphorus and potassium in as um, preservatives. Okay. Because potassium and phosphorus are added to a lot of your foods, for instance, bakery foods, because it is a, phosphorus in particular is a preservative. And it's not going to necessarily say phosphorus. It'll say phosphorus, blah, blah, blah. Right. I have my hidden phosphorus list. And well, <laughs> as long as you see the phospho. Right. Or the phosphate or something like that. Yeah, but I mean, and it'll be, it. it can be phosphobenzenate. Okay. But that's phosphorus. Okay. 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 So either phospho or the phosphate is When phosphorus. you see anything that looks like it could possibly be part of phosphorus, that's phosphorus. Gotcha. But you know, some water at Sam's has, uh, I think, potassium in it. So just look at the label. Okay. Thank and like you the much. vitamin waters, I wouldn't do like the vitamin or the enhanced water. Like usually they, it's kind of like the Gatorades, they'll enhance them with various electrolytes like the potassium or phosphorus or calcium. And um, I wouldn't, I would just do like plain, just plain water. Um, so if it's plain bottled water, but I wouldn't do like Jane was saying, anything of the enhanced waters. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? No, Nadia, um, Sunrise has a really good water. It's a alkaline water <laughs> called real water. I never okay. checked for the phosphorus, but it really tastes good. So if you're near a sunrise, you should probably check that out. It's really good water. It's a little okay, high, thank but you. it's delicious. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, if there's no other questions, I'll say that that concludes our, our six-part weekly series. And I, I truly hope that these presentations have been helpful for you guys. Um, I want to say thanks to Telogen for the support of the program. I especially want to thank Dory, Melissa, and Victoria, and Jane for lending their expertise uh, over the course of the last six weeks and being so generous with their time. 
Uh, I, of course, want to thank those of you who have joined us um, for many or all of the programs. Uh, in case you missed any of these sessions, uh, as I've said before, we will be sharing a link uh, to the videos in the coming days. So 